Um, okay, David, you ready to go? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'm going to spotlight you for the for the room. Where is it? Spotlight for everybody. Okay, you got the, Good. You got the floor. Good. Well, I've got a stack of natural edge bowls here, and uh, that I've been making for the IRDs that I've been doing. And the reason I was interested in presenting them is is because I know that the concept of design can be a little intimidating for a lot of people, but it really doesn't need to be. It's it's fundamentally a, a, an element of learning how to see what you're looking at. And in the case of a natural edge bowl, uh, this particular one, for instance, I got the light on, is geometrically balanced left, right, and up and down. And it has coloration going around below the sapwood all the way around. It's really quite a nice, simple, simple bowl, but- Show us the foot, David, please. What's that? Show us the underside. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, and then the second one is a variation from that, especially with regard to the foot. It's got the geometry of the grain patterns in it, but it's <laughs> on the end of the log, and this is where I'm looking at, seeing what I'm looking at. On the end of the log, I saw the, this pith area with these turkey tracks going through it and cracks where they're all stained. So I decided to, to do the, the the greatest heresy of all, and that is stick the pith in the bottom of a bowl. But the, the point I'm getting at is that as you are, uh, assuming you have access to greenwood, as you are working the farms, it's from the very outset when you when you first cut off the end grain and the log, you're learning stuff from it. And it's that stuff that, that creates the interest in the bowl uh, uh, from then on. Now this bowl may not be a utilitarian because of the pith in the center, uh, but I still think it's very interesting transition from the first one. This one here is one you may overlook when you're walking through the woods, but this has got a branch sticking out. So I selected it specifically because I saw the branch on the side of the log and I knew it would, something would happen inside as we opened it up. It's not geometrically balanced, but it's fairly close, but that doesn't matter. It's a progression, in other words, from the original two that I showed you. And then the third one, this is one of my favorites, is, is the, the, lep the leopard or the, uh, <laughs> the snake bowl, so to speak. This has got the turkey tracks in the bottom. It's got a little branch over on the, the left as you're looking at it. And it's got this really wonderful little animal up there on the top. And the more of these things that you play around with, the more you discover when you when you got the log on the ground, what's possible to do as a quote design. Now, what I try and do is instead of designing a bowl is I try and develop it as I go. So I'm learning as I'm cutting away the stuff I know I don't want. And then <clears throat> from that knowledge, I'm, I'm changing it between spur center, the drive center, and the live tailstock center in order to get what I want out of it. But I don't know what that's necessarily going to be when I start it out. It's a matter of discovering as you go. So, and the last one I have here is kind of fun. This is a cherry piece. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with geometry, but it's got a nice handle on the side. And I thought that was kind of fun. So that's all I had to say. I've taken my hour long down to about six minutes, I think. <laughs> Any questions that you have, I'm quite happy to, to field them. I'll go back to gallery view and let's uh, let's see if there's questions and comments. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I, that last one that you made a handle on, um, I'm assuming when you when you started turning it, there was a feature on the side of the wood that you saw? or Yes, or... yes. it was another branch sticking out of the side. Okay. On a and... tree. And if I if I looked at that uh, closely, there is still um, there was still a pseudo geometry. Even though you said there is no geometry, there is still a, two points on the away from um, center between the handles between on this. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Are are they sort of centered on the grain when you did they it? Are, they're not centered on the grain. They're balanced, and they are the only element of geometric stability to it. They are at the same height from the floor to the top of the tips. Okay. Yeah. So, so they would they have gone down the, the okay? I, I'm seeing what you're saying, and it does look like it goes down in the center of the 
of the grain right. of the tree. And the classic annual ring that you get down here in the bottom is achievable if you can put the, the uh, tailstock point on the line of the pith in the bottom of the form when you first start out and everything works off of that. But in okay. this situation, it, I couldn't do that because I, would, I was gonna lose my, uh, my bridge up here at the top. Okay. So it's kind of fun to play around with. And, and I'll, I, I'll, I'll be quite honest that when I made the shift from dry functional wood, I call it, to green wood, it changed my entire outlook as to what the future of my career was going to be in wood turning because I realized the wood's talking back to me and I need to listen to it, meaning yeah. I need to observe it and then make changes in the shape and the form and the presentation of it between the, at the very beginning as I learn about it, but between the, the spur center, and the drive center, and the tailstock center. And most of those changes are going to be in the tailstock center. But a few of them can be in the in the in the, sp in the top of the drive center. Are, are you saying that you mount the wood between centers and then fool around with where the tailstock center is, like try absolutely, to absolutely, absolutely. How many okay. different locations would you try? Well, it depends on what I find. Well, typically, two well, or two or three. Uh, it could be in a in a, for instance, in the first one that I have, it could be the height. Of the of the of the wingtips, it could be the height of what I call the saddle of the design down in here. It could be the center point down in the bottom where the pith goes through, uh, below, above the pith. Uh, well, back, the, up, uh, back up for a second. Down. Back up for a second, David. How are you uh, obtaining and preparing those blanks? Are you bandsawing that out of logs? Or uh, no, this is not. Well, it, could, it could be bandsawed, but uh, this was not. I was cutting the log off. Uh, at a certain height and then cutting it in half with a chainsaw and then taking that directly to the lathe and cutting the four corners off uh, with the, either with the chainsaw or while it's spinning around and beginning to shape itself. A small bowl like this, the four corners are really no difficulty in turning them off while it's spinning around. Now, if you got a 20 inch diameter bowl, that'd be a little bit different. <laughs> but it, as I'm roughing it out, I'm, I'm learning more about the material and I can make changes as I go. The point being is manipulating the piece is, some, is something that when I came into turning, nobody was doing because they were mm. all working with dry wood. And what you mm. see is what you get. But when I went to Greenwood, suddenly manipulation became the key to getting the the quote design out of the form as I was developing what I was looking at. So I think uh, all of those bowls have feet, but the design of the feet are not the same. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, the design of the feet is pretty much the same on all of them in terms of, of diameter and, and certainly location. Uh, and it has been undercut on the bottom. But these, again, these are decorative objects. They're not intended to be utilitarian, so that the, the design, diameter of the foot doesn't really matter. And it's just a matter of elevating it, you see in the silhouette, so that it gives it a sense of lift off the table automatically. If I make that, that foot any larger in diameter than it, than it is here, say I broaden it out to there, then it looks like it's glued to the table when it sits down. What do you do when the bark starts to fly off? <laughs> cut, the tr cut the tree in the wintertime inst in instead of the summer or the springtime and the bark will generally, generally stay on, especially with poplar. Now, um, Bradford pear is another really good one to hold <clears throat> bark. But again, you need to cut them in the, in the, in the wintertime when it's cold. Now, it's not very cold down here in North Carolina, but in Pennsylvania, it certainly was. And uh, the only problem that you have with green wood in case of ash and in poplar is this sub bark underneath the hard bark, outer bark, is softer <laughs> and it will shrink. And when it shrinks, it leaves a, a, the wall comes up like this and all of a sudden there's this group like that and then the hard bark is on top of that. And that may be a distraction to you uh, when you start to, to sand it because the bowl, if you cut it at an eighth of an inch and then you start sanding it, by the time the 
the sub bark starts to dry out and shrink, you're going to have a, a low spot all the way around that may be a distraction to you. So you may want to cut it at a quarter of an inch thick and then let it dry and then sand it and get down to the bottom of that of that depression on the, on uh, the you start, Are you talking about sanding on the lathe or off the lathe? Uh, I sand on the lathe when possible, but not while it's spinning, because obviously you would you would damage the encroaching encroaching edge on it. Uh, so I use a, a five inch diameter disc, uh, soft uh, foam rubber disc with Abernet mesh. Uh, it's not a paper; it's actually a plastic, but it's in different grits from about. I usually start about about uh, two two forty. And, uh, and then go up to 600. But I can do that in my lap, you see, once I'm done with it. And especially the very bottom needs to be, uh, needs to be sanded by hand. But I just love those turkey tracks and I think they're just, just the nuts. Do you, do you ever sand wet so that you have some, you know, when uh, yes. I get a piece of burl or whatever, you get a different tactile finish because the wood then ripples naturally when it's dried out. Exactly. And, and that's why I use the Abernet because it's a, it's a mesh and it can be cleaned. Whereas okay. regular sandpaper, all of the good sandpapers, you can't clean them. Well, you can to a degree, but uh, not to the effect effectiveness that you want. <laughs> pardon me but yes that was the boom to me because i was going through ream after ream of, of sandpaper before i discovered the abernet and, and what do you how do you clean it just yeah. out of curiosity oh you, just, you either shake it out or you blow it out with your air compressor or you stick it under a faucet and because it's plastic so it doesn't matter after okay. it dries out it's and i get them i get that stuff from steve worcester down in plano texas uh, he's got them, and um, oh, what's the other? Bruce Hoover has it with with uh, the sandingglove.com. Yeah. Now, do you finish those bowls like that, and what do you put on them if you're going to finish it? Uh, if I'm going to finish them, and I'm not, uh, they're off the tool. If I'm going to finish them, I would use a spray acrylic lacquer or a wipe on poly. Now, why? If, would you why would you not finish him or why would you finish him? What's the difference? Well, the difference basically is, is that I don't make a living selling open bowls and I don't want to encroach on other people's right to do that, but I'd rather give them away and let somebody else deal with them in their own time and, and, and enjoy that, that whole interaction uh, uh, while they're, while they're growing with their skills and they're and, and, and kind of drooling over what, what uh, what's in front of them and what to do with it because obviously uh, uh, finishes is a very delicate topic uh, within wood turning and furniture as well uh, it depends of course on the material that you're working with the degree that you've sanded it down or finished it or scraped it with a cabinet scraper or uh, what species it is or what you want it to do if you want it to be a utilitarian object or just a functional or a, 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 a decorative object. And I found that poplar doesn't receive oil well, it darkens it. So I wouldn't use, for instance, a Mahoney uh, oil on it because it has walnut uh, uh, stain in it, but I could, I could probably use mineral oil, uh, that'll darken it to a certain degree. But um, if you wanted to, to, to really hang out and, and work for you and be handled a lot, a uh, wipe on poly is, is, a, is a great way to go. And it doesn't, it doesn't stain the wood. It doesn't darken it or anything. Any more so, questions for David? Yeah, David, I want to go back to the way you said you'd mount the piece originally on the lathe. Do you, sure. do you use a spur center at your head? And yes. then... And, and then are you moving the head at all? Or are you just moving the tailstock to center up the piece? The latter. Um, the reason that I, that I work between centers is clear, but the purpose of using a four prongs drive center as opposed to a two prong drive center is that when you work with a lot of students, they have so many things to think about when they're just getting started or even in, in the more advanced areas of their, of their, of their work they forget to tighten the tailstock. And when that happens, the spur, spur drive starts drilling a hole in the top in the sapwood of the, of the form. 
and it stops it from spinning. So the obvious thing you do is, is you stop the lathe, uh, hopefully, and find out what the problem is and then clean out the four-pronged spur drive. But the key is, is that the object will pretty much always stay on the lathe itself when that happens, because you know something's wrong. But if you're working with a two-prong center, it will, you line it up with the grain so it goes deeper into the wood. That's correct. But if you forget to tighten that tailstock down between every cut that you're making while you're roughing it out, it can slip sideways. And when it slips sideways, that whole thing's going to leave your lathe and, and it, you could be in the way or the person watching you could be in the way. It's pretty dangerous. So, uh, so how much time do you have in one of those things? I'm sorry? How much time do you have in one of those bowls? Oh, about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. That's, see, see, that's the key. That's the difference between experimenting with uh, tools and going with what was always there. And what was always there was a great tool, but it didn't have the side grind on it. And that's the traditional bowl gouge. The other key is having 40 years worth of turning bowls behind you as well. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt a bit. <laughs> uh, David, I have a couple of comments on, on aligning the, the, the grain on the, on the wood. What I do, uh, I try to find as best I can find the center on the, on the drive in, put the spur drive in, and then bring the tailstock up. Then I measure from the headstock over to the the border between the grain, uh, wood grain and the bark. Then turn okay. it 180 degrees and measure again. If it's a half inch off, well then I can raise or lower the tailstock to get that. And I measure the, the four corners, the, the wide side and the high, the high side and the low side of the bowl. And I can get very, very close to a balanced uh, bowl with the, with the height of the edges. And that's very simple and it's easy to do. Agreed. Agreed. What, I, what I'm kind of hinting at in here in working with green wood and working between centers is that all the early books, Dale's creative wood turning book and everything else, talked about drilling a hole in the, in this case, it would be in the bark area or in any, in any piece, drilling a hole in there, putting it on a screw chuck or a faceplate on the top, what's going to be the top of the bowl, because you're going to cut that out anyway. And then bringing the tailstock in to to finish to secure it and finish it off. The problem with that is that once you've drilled that hole, you've aligned the grain of the form to the lathe. You're not giving yourself an opportunity to play around with that alignment by changing it, for instance, in the tailstock. Yeah, right. It's easy to measure to the headstock. In some cases, with a natural edge bowl, if you've got a a, a log. Uh, that has a limb coming out of it. That limb may be a very beautiful area to fix your your uh, uh, your uh, your your top of your wing of one of your wings, and you may end up with one wing much higher than the other, which could be quite exciting to see. Plus, that you'll see figure grain going down all the way to the center of the of the bowl on both the inside and the outside. Excuse me. Kai, you got your hand up. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask um, David something about um, design. When I started turning green wood, I pre-turned the bowls thick walled and then once dry, I finished them. And what I did, I just um, discarded everything that had a defect in it. So I just took the, the nice straight wood and if there was a big knot or something like this. I just didn't use it. But right. um, you seem to look for these um, defects. So my question is, um, how did you develop the eye for seeing that you can use a defect or a branch or whatever um, as an advantage in the design of your, your bowls? Is it just experience? Did you experiment and try different, um, different bowls with defects in it? Or do you actually see it and then say, okay, I can do that with this branch or this kind of um, <laughs> knot or whatever? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, be be before, before Dave answers, Kai, I just want to point out that we and the uh, our quality control changed the term from defect to feature. 
Ah, okay. So, 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 yeah, anyway, sorry, go ahead, Dave. Well, first of all, I never read the books. So I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah, okay. Second of all, my background is in sculpture, in the fine arts. And I'm constantly looking for oddities and, and innuendo. And I found it in green wood because I couldn't get it in dry wood. And the reason I was using dry wood is in the mountains of Colorado, all you have is ponderosa pine and aspen and nobody would buy that stuff. So I was buying dimensional lumber and quickly running out of money uh, because it got to be so expensive. But when, when I first encountered green material, suddenly this whole new world opened up for me and looking at something and appreciating what it was and accepting the fact that it was part of the, of, of the, of the natural growth of the form to begin with, why not include it? Yeah, well, I like the idea and I like the idea of including it, but for me, if I have um, a lock, for example, that I got for free because someone felt a tree and gave it to me, and then um, I sometimes just don't see the thing the way you seem to see it so i don't see the the defect and how i can or i see the defect or the um the feature whatever um but i don't get the idea how to use it to advantage so um well I what think can i do to I develop think... my um view and to get into kind of the the design mode so that i can say okay that's something you can use. <laughs> that's, that's shared with a lot of people. And I think that, that there are several things involved. First of all, don't be afraid to play with the wood. Mm -hmm. Give yourself the freedom to play and to make mistakes. Because if you're not making mistakes, I don't think you're learning a whole lot. If you're repeating your, your process and you want to switch that process around or advance your knowledge of that process. That's the key right there, is not being afraid to make mistakes. And just go and see what you come up with and learn a new language in effect. I just heard a radio program talking about Don't put a whole lot of value in each piece at the start. Be, be prepared to lose it and you're good. Sure. Yeah. This radio program I heard is talking about apprentice of learning uh, culinary cooking and and the, the professor says you make them make one mistake every day that's how you learn <laughs> i want to make a comment about kai asked looking about for features and so forth i would imagine david could probably show us a, a hollow form that has more voids in it than it does wood and some of the things he's made in the past that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's true it's quite exciting actually watching the tool work inside while you're turning the outside we got is that mike okay the question i have david going back to mounting between centers and since you don't normally move the piece between the <coughs> headstock wouldn't there be an advantage then to drilling a hole to reduce the risk of the piece flying off uh and not mounting it with a face plate not mounting it with a glue block but still just having that hole to capture the the drive center whether it's a two prong or a four prong I've never tried it, but I do know that from a teacher's point of view, rather than my point of view, uh, that knowing that it's going to drill its own hole, if you don't have pressure up against it, is a valuable tool because it causes the student to think about what they're doing as they're doing it. In other words, if I put a, a piece of poplar on, which is soft material and presumably green, and I bring the tailstock up and I, and I start the speed down low and I uh, rev it up a little bit to get a cut active uh, on the wood, once I make that initial cut, I, am, I emphasize the concept of nibbling, meaning using the tip of the gouge to nibble at the, at the four corners, or if you've cut them off with a, the with a chainsaw, eight corners, as it's spinning around. And, and then const every time you make a cut, you're constantly uh, tightening that tailstock. Uh, and it's a great way to get involved in the safety of the form as opposed to the rush to make the form. 
because there's always that 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 internal clock that says, uh, you know, I really want to get going. I really want to come up. What I really want is the finished option when I'm first starting out. What you, what you really be little... at that, what, you'll learn more if you lose your focus on the finished object and you get into the process. Correct. Correct. And I think his idea of, of, of keeping the center from slipping by drilling a hole is probably a good one, but it's still going to slip because yep. it's soft, wet wood. It, it, it's not the slipping as much as the risk of losing a bowl in a class. Yeah. Uh, no, if you're I'm, doing one on one, I can see the emphasis of of encouraging the tightening and you're watching them or, or two or three. But once you start getting a class of eight people, then it seems to me the, the the shift would be more toward safety for the for the group and reducing the risk of a bowl flying off by just having a little more of a secure area there on. Oh, the I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. And I and I I have tried that in the past, and it does work. That's true. The the real question is where do you drill a hole? <laughs> and everybody has different opinions. About yeah. That. Well, you, you indicated that you normally place it right on the pith and and get it and get that part first, and then most of the rebalancing is on the tailstock. It looks like you could still do that with. Well, in this case, the tailstock is the tailstock is on the pith. Yes. Oh, the. I got. I got you. So yeah, you're saying you. you're saying the adjustment then is at the headstock area, not the tailstock. No, it's both. Both. Uh, I would take a spade bit, like an inch and a half flat spade bit, and I would drill a hole through the bark and put the drive center there. Then I've got the freedom of adjusting the tailstock center, the live center in the on the on the pith or off the pith or wherever, as I'm trimming out the, the form. And I'm and as I do that, every time I make a change, or even before I make a change, every time I make a cut, I tighten that tailstock down to be certain the drive center is secure. And when I get done with it, I can pull it. In almost every case, I can pull the tailstock away, and it'll just sit there hanging on the spur spur drive because it's drilled itself in an inch and a half. So. Uh, Karen, Karen Swanton, you got a question? This you'll be the last question here. We're on the half hour. Karen, are you there? It's just an observation. I the discussion was talking about the wood is having defects, and I'd rather look at it as the wood telling you what the opportunities are. Correct. Well, and I just want to say thank you to Mr. Ellsworth because I just find your discussions fascinating. Thank you. Oh well, thank you. And that's a that's a wonderful uh, ha wonderful half of the hour.